with this next one. We'll just sing a couple verses of it. Court Dwyer. I'm a past president of the Maine Society of Sons of the American Revolution, currently with the Color Guard, and we usually lead the parade uh, every year that celebrates the uh, Margareta Affair, which is the first true naval battle of the American Revolution. Uh, there are other battles that occurred from a ship to shore all up and down the East Coast. But this one in Machias is the first one that was ship to ship. So it's the first naval battle of the American Revolution held right here in a wonderful little town. They had the cannon and we just had the rifles and pitchforks and lances and sabers and things like that. We won. That's right. A really, really good rifleman could get off two shots in a minute. And if you notice, they're triangular. They're not blades. That was done on purpose so that they would create a hole instead of a slice. The uh, medical uh, 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 people at the time knew how to sew up a slice. They didn't know how to take care of a hole. Well, it was a defeat for us, but uh, we, we tried, we, when we ran away, we tried to uh, say, shout, huzzah for King George. <laughs> and this is Barbara Ward. And this is our weapon. This flint is so tricky to get it to stay in there and not break, because they break after like seven or, seven or eight times they'll break. This is a tower pistol. It's, um, 
It's a British pistol, and it was mass produced in 1977. I think after the, the bicentennial. It's a replica. It's six nine caliber, so it's got a massive, a massive bullet comes out of here, and it probably wouldn't hit anything. My husband would have enlisted in the um, British Army. And if you were Scottish at the time, you were um, not allowed to wear kilts. And what happened is when the wives and children came, did come with their husbands, because if they left back in Scotland, there was no one to take care of them. So we would have come here, and if we would have worked for the company, such as you know the officers and that sort of thing, cooking, cleaning, mending, and sewing, we would have gotten half rations, which is half of what is practically not that much anyway. But if we brought the children with us, we would have had to work outside the home or outside the barracks to earn the money to feed our children too. Halifax was a big base and then came down to Castine and then from there to I believe the Carolinas. I teach a wide range of courses, such as marine mammals and pelagic birds. That's where we've been working together. Marine bio, oceanography, general ecology, off and on ichthyology, which is, does anyone know that one? Study of fish, very good. And invertebrate zoology, ornithology, study of birds. It keeps me busy. The typical process is that you go out from a long distance, you take photographs, so what you're doing would be useful, and uh, you uh, fill out the assessment sheet, which has to do with how thin the animal is, if the behavior is normal, the respiration rates, heart rates, anything you can get from a distance. Believe it or not, you can get the heart rate sometimes. If you look right be, uh, behind the, the front flippers, you can sometimes see the heart uh, pounding just a little bit like that, so that's very cool. Then you call that back into Allied Whale because we work under their license. So if they say, yes, there's room, you've got to pick that one up. That's when we go out and um, rescue the seal. We wear nitro gloves, we're very careful. We can get respiratory diseases from them. There are all sorts of nasties. So we want to do that one. But we went down, picked it up. It was the students who did that. We did the basic care and took it on to COA. And the result of it was it went down to Cape Cod and finally was released. John Constant, C O N S T A N T. And Karen Constant, C O N S T A N T. Well, we smoke salmon and uh, we put them on a skewer so people can eat them like you would popsicles. This takes three days to produce. It takes us 10 hours smoking, 12 hours brining. And of course, by the time we get done wrapping and letting it chill, it takes us three day process. Well, we've been smoking fish for 24 years.
to sing this song if you No, when I was a kid, I was growing up, you know, I had a pretty rough childhood. My father drank a lot, and he was a beautiful man. And uh, so, when he died, I was happy, you know, and no, no more beatings. So I started drinking, and I, you know, I was out of control. In the middle, you know, I was getting in trouble. I got locked up. The first time I got locked up, I was 40 years old. I was drunk on Main Street up here. So I got in a lot of trouble. I was always in jail. Every time he turned around, I was in jail. So I went south. So I went to North Carolina. Got me a job, whatever. Then I got introduced in drugs, cocaine. I passed the cop going 115 miles an hour. I blew by the cops, and I had 16 pounds of coke and 30 gallons of moonshine, and I was flying. I guess the car went six times in the wind. I come up through the back window, and they said, on a full flip, on 75 feet through the air, I landed on a big concrete button. I got a scar with my head to go from there nope. all the way back to here. So when I woke up four months later, I was in a body cast and I couldn't move, couldn't talk, didn't know where I was, who I was, and they says, you've been in a coma for four months and you're lucky to be alive. I mean, I was dead twice, but that didn't stop me. I was bulletproof, I thought it was. So they then threw me in jail. My room is as bright as this room right here. 24 hours a day. I had a concrete bed, I had a toilet, a sink, a light, and a mirror. Hello, my name is Curtis W. Carver. We represent CW Data Recovery of Maine. Well, it's kind of funny because I started out, I was doing computers, and next thing I ended up, I was doing cell phones. And now, lo and behold, I've been doing TVs, and I've also been doing Xboxes and, and Sony Playstations. Well, electronics uh, started out when I was really young. And I finally got my electrical engineering technology degree. And then, my biggest thing was, and I believe it was 1999, I went to vocational tech in Calus. This is a forensic equipment for like if you're on, if you're out in the field. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. These are different types of magnets. This is for like working for an Apple iPhone, iPad. Well, I started a business in 1996. And you, you look at the overall picture and you say, well, now what is there out there that I can do that's going to bring more income? And I believe it was 210 or 211 that I started learning the process of computer forensics. And I really think that I love computer forensics out of everything that I've done. I love challenges. Yeah, yeah, I think that's kind of neat. Yeah. After that, just this year, I started doing TVs and cell phones. For instance, you take this, there, 
there you go. Now I'm doing Xboxes and uh, Sony Playstations. Jack of all trades, master of none. That is about the best way you could put it. The thing that, it, that really has kept me together is my wife. I couldn't give any more credit to anybody else but her. She said, honey, we need to do this. And we do this. And that's the way it goes. Well, I'll tell you, there is a lot of people in this town that can do pretty much the same as I can as far as the computer work. If you can't fix a problem, you uh, glue it together and hope it works. It's kind of like MacGyver. I'd reach out to neighbors, you know, some, someone I could trust. Realistically, I'd uh, reach out to friends and family and, you know, see if I have a, a good neighborhood, which I live in personally. I live in a town called Tilton, New Hampshire, and that's a smaller town over in New Hampshire. However, I'd reach out to neighbors, you know, some, someone I could trust, and I'd ask for some simple advice. And again, it really depends on the problem. problems are going on that example real quickly I mean I got a buddy who owns a garage and if I was in the tight bind I'd say hey you know what, what can we do to try and solve this problem I'm in the tight bind what can we do and, and we try to work together on a scope of you know a number of solutions I guess and, and and see what we could work on if it were something another small example could be hey you know my snowblower broke you know do you have a snow plow I'll, I'll pay you when I can I'm in a bind or or whatever have you or I know you know Joe Doe uh, John Doe down the road is you know he's having a hard time getting around he's got mobility issues I own a snowblower it's only a quick walk down the road I can go help him out A good example would, would be, I guess, on that, my, my neighbors are elderly. They have two homes, one in Massachusetts, one, of course, right next to my house. We share a driveway, in fact. I told them they had a snowblower guy, or a snowplow guy, excuse me, come over, and he was the guy who plowed their driveway. And I said, uh, you know what, I own a snowblower. I'll take care of it for you guys. And they said, well, you know what, can we pay you for it? And I said, no, 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 I'm not looking for any money. I'm just going to help you out, just trying to be there for somebody because they're having a hard time walking around and things like that. Exactly, and that's the thing. I'm just trying to be a nice person. That's all it is. I'm not, I'm not out looking for any recognition on the back, you know? Are we going, guys? Yes, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not missing this. <laughs> He's been in there since last night. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a uh, baby harbor seal that was uh, we got a call we were in the middle of class and uh, we had to rush out there 
check it out. Uh, the first step is always uh, you stay back a ways so it, you're not going to disturb it at all. You use a, um, a spotting scope to look at it and record all this data, uh, whether or not it's malnourished. Does it look skinny? Does it look bloated? Is it moving its head at all? Is it sleeping? Is it making noise? Um, just all these different observations that you uh, need to make of it before you even think about moving in. And then you need to call a uh, professional, someone that is actually uh, qualified in saying, yes, you can take the seal, no, you can't take the seal. And we ended up getting the yes. So we went in and a couple of us, I was actually one of the lucky ones that actually got to uh, wrap the towel up and pick the seal up. And uh, we carried him down into a crate, which we, um, brought back to campus and then Krauss took it to where it needed to go and we actually a few weeks later we got an email back from the place that we sent it to and uh, she was doing really well she was uh, getting much better and um, I believe that she's been released so it was it was a it was a really fun rewarding experience Eight years all before, I had four years in prison and four years of probation. I've been there almost two years. I've been there about 18 months then. About two weeks later, I was looking in my little stainless steel mirror on the wall. And I look, and I see this face looking back at me. I said, you know, I think I figured out what the problem is. I'm looking at it. So now what, what do I want to do? Do I want to come up back here for four more years? Because that's what's going to happen when I drink. Or do I want to try something different? I'm not religious. I believe in God as far as it goes. I don't go to church. I got on my knees and I asked that guy up there, they call God. I said, you can help me survive this alive. I'll make you a promise that I'll never ever drink the drug again. Elvers are baby eels. Um, we catch them to sell them to China, South Korea as a food source. Elvers look like they're glass clear. And then see how they're starting to get a stripe down their back? The vertebrae is starting to show. They're going to be turning brown pretty soon. Um, they can grow up to six, seven pounds. Depends how big they want to grow them to in China or wherever uh, they get Food source size is like one to two pounds. When it's, you know, that two, three pounds. I've never eaten it myself, but a lot of people enjoy it and said um, it's see, a real good here's a brown taste. one. They go to a different stage and they call them zippers and they use these for bait. Yeah, here. Um, we're getting a good price for them. Um, when, when we did it in 2003, they were $85 a pound. And now they're up this to year, they're up, three to $2,600. they are up to $2,600 a pound. And people don't realize that they need air because they slime, they need the oxygen. But you can look in the tank. If, you put right? the but this in. is off like that. When the tide comes in, the floats bring the net up and it opens right up. How did you do, Jeff? And they swim in with the incoming tide at night. That guy right there, Kelsey, back in uh, 94. He uh, showed us how to do it and we've been fishing ever since. You know, it's nowadays, though, it's a lot, you know, it's a lot friendlier fishery, that's for sure, than it used to be in the old days. So I'm on the tank, that one. Oh, he's trying to get away here. <laughs> but they're very small and it like takes two to 3,000 of them to make a pound, people don't realize. 
<laughs> As you know, any problems that arise, you have to just take care of it when they do arise. And, and we try take to care help. of it the best you, of your ability, you know what I mean? And we try to do the buddy system, because you fall, you get hurt. Um, Jeff, um, a few years back, up in the falls, because we used to fish up there, he fell and broke his back and his neck and laid till the tide came up. So we try to do the buddy system, and now they let you have a helper if you can't physically do it. Because it's ever since seasonal up here. So you have to learn how to work seasonal and save that money. Oh yeah, because people say, oh, you know, you made 25000 in your season or whatever. That's just a ballpark figure I'm using. But people don't realize you have to pay them. In like other parts of the world, like Europe and Asia, they use these electric trawling fish fishing boats, which like pretty much totally catch everything. So compared to like other parts of the world, our fishery in Maine, and between that, we put fish, uh, fish excluder panels in the entrance to the bag. The catch bag that catch, you know keeps all the big fish out, and it's like we have extreme. It's, we've taken a lot of measures over the years. Like Maine's been real wise to have a very low impact fishery. The way we fish, you know, we have to be sustainable to keep on being fishermen. So I mean, this, like as far but as far as like worldwide fishing goes, though, this is as low, as low impact as you can get. What we do in Maine. I'm Joseph Plum Martin, and I've been asked to talk a little bit about my Revolutionary War experiences. By 1775, having earlier resolved not to put my body in the way of flying bullets, I decided that I was as warm a patriot as anyone might be, and I was beginning to get very anxious to join. They were calling for short-term levies. And so in July, I signed for a six-month term of service as part of the Connecticut Continentals. These, these, these men do not make history books. You don't find paragraphs about Joseph Plum Martin. You don't find paragraphs about the men who captured the Margareta or the death of Lieutenant Jones. But these were the people that facilitated the change. You can't do these without the small communities. And so places like Machias or Portsmouth, New Hampshire, there were, there were battles there that rarely make the history books unless you're from New Hampshire. Uh, you know, what Joseph Plum Martin went through, he was unrecognized for a century after he wrote his memoirs. It was only in the 1950s that a historian found his memoirs and began to broadcast what he'd done. And he gives a point of view from the soldier's point of view. He's not talking about grand strategy and this kind of stuff. He's talking about the grunts. The guys who lived and died and starved and went naked at Valley Forge and Morristown and suffered and froze and went through all the hardships in order to facilitate an end. I moved to Joplin when I was about 11 to be near a family, my mother's family. Graduated from high school there. I couldn't decide where in all the rubble my house was supposed to be. Be. The neighbor across the street, a very nice man, stalked me and told me where my house was. And I said, I can't remember what it was. There was nothing there but bricks. And my piano was in three yards away. There wasn't anything there. So the trees looked like they had been sanded. All the trees in the tornado line were smooth, like when you make a chair. They were, that's how long the tornado was on the ground. Very unusual. If, you live in, if you're from the Midwest, you're not unfamiliar with tornadoes, but they're usually very erratic and they don't stay on the ground very long. Unfortunately, this um, tornado stayed on the ground for 13 miles. So it was on the ground for 13 miles and three miles wide. So a third of the town was leveled and we were unfortunately in that part of the town. So it took, the tornado hit, um, I think it was 520 in the afternoon. He didn't, couldn't get to our house till nine o'clock. 
So it was a long wait and very upsetting. And you've, I've never been through anything like that before. And so your mind is going, what are you supposed to do? I have my Jeep and I have my poor dog. And where do you go? So we didn't really look in New England, even though my I'm an only child and all my family's gone. My mother's gone and everything. But he has some siblings in, in Maine and New Hampshire. We didn't really look there until, and neither one of us could remember, we liked cold weather, so we wanted to go north. Um, we were looking at an atlas, and we thought if it had a college or university, that would be good. That always has some offerings that a town that doesn't have that has. And on the atlas, there are little symbols that say that there's an airport or a college or a museum. And neither one of us can remember who found it first, but we were looking at an atlas, and we thought, we noticed there is a symbol here that in this town called Machias, there is a college. Well, that's in New England, that's in Maine, and lo and behold, it's close to water. <laughs> so I came up in October of uh, 2016 and stayed and looked and drove around, and then we decided to take the plunge. <laughs> So the battle room was the uh, retaliation for the, the capture of the Margareta and the, uh, and the killing of the commander of the Margareta. The long shot that was taken by my grandfather and uh, which killed the opposing commander and that's what basically won the war and, and confused the whole opposing force. Shot from the, the famous shot by uh, by the chief. chief Congratulations! Captain. You must be really proud. Of oh, it. that's a great heritage to have in your past. Oh, you know? definitely, definitely, and we're honored to for all of us to be a part of this because a lot of the descendants of, of you know a lot of 
you know, the individuals that that were here back in the day, are, their, their descendants are still here. <laughs> They're still here today and honored to play a part of it. <laughs> graduation season so we were actually at a friend's graduation party I went to work um, he picked me up we went to friend's house and um, got the call. I got the call my mom was terrified she uh, I figured out later she didn't know where I was for about 20 minutes and uh, I answered the phone hey mom what's up and she said I'll never forget the terror in her voice she said oh Melissa, thank God you're okay. Your house is on fire. And I just, I said, what? And I just, I hopped in the car and I didn't believe it. And um, I was kind of in shock the whole way home. And I saw it halfway home across the bay. And it was just, I saw a big fireball. And I said, oh my God, JJ, it's all gone. Our house is gone. It just, it was gone before it was even, it even got called in. It's just, it's so surreal. I feel like I could just reach out and touch it all. The first, the, the second night actually, we came home and my parents live right across the street and he put up, I felt him put on the brakes and I totally expected to turn right into my driveway and instead we turned into my parents and I just, I lost it. It just, it's, it, I, you don't wish this on anybody. And you never think it's going to happen to you. No. And everything you own could just be gone in an instant. I'm still having flashbacks of, oh shoot, I had this in my house. My grandmother's bird call. I talked to the birds morning and I used my grandmother's bird call. She, I was eight years old when she gave me that. They always hung on a nail wherever I've been, you know. Yeah. Some things you just can't replace. You can't replace that. Oh, schlub. I, uh... I messaged my boss <laughs> while we were watching my house burn and I said, I don't even know what to say, my house just burnt down. Uh, I won't be in tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, the next day she, um, she said, okay, we're having a supper for you next week and this is the time and this is the place and you better just be there. <laughs> and uh, uh, everyone just sprinted into action. Um, we're, we've both been born and raised in Washington County, and um, this is such an amazing place to grow up. Our neighbors are amazing. We have to take care of each other, and, and we do. Um, and you know, just, you have to love people, because uh, you never know when something like this is going to happen to you, and you have to help out. Yeah. The turnout here is amazing. This week I've been saying um, to people, our broken hearts are so full right now. 
Um, we've been getting so many messages, so many calls, so many visits, so many people wanting to just do something. Um, our heads are still spinning. I don't, I, I don't know what everyone can do. Just love us. I mean, you feel the love. It's an energy. Hi, my name is Denis Rene Joseph Fortin. And uh, as far as the weirdest animal that someone that actually had me stuff was a muskrat and a black Labrador that had his paws like this and laying on his chin near his wood sole. <coughs> my dad. Up in the Rustica, that's how we did cows. We, we tamed the hides for the cows. We did our own leather. We fished our own stuff. We mounted our own, you know, just something to do in the winter time to keep us occupied during, during the cold days. That's how Washington Sun was started in uh, 1818 by my great 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 grandfather Samuel Bartlett Wadsworth, and um, it was immediately after the British, right in around the time the British were turning the Eastport back over to the U.S. So Eastport's been through a whole lot of things over the years, including uh, four years of British occupation. So uh, the business started out out on the piers as a marine. Uh, Strictly a ship chandlery. S.B. Wadsworth had uh, his own ship and did a lot of moving around between Halifax and Boston uh, with marine traffic. It survived two major disasters because uh, it uh, burned in the Great Fire and, uh, you know, it also went out to sea in the Groundhog Ga Day Gale of 76 here. That's when we moved back across the street. But then in uh, February 2nd of 1976, the uh, Groundhog Day Gale came along. Only really affected Eastport and Bangor, but it really affected us. And what was left of Wadsworth at the time, which was a large pier with a very large warehouse building and all different buildings along it, and then a separate warehouse building, all of them, when the morning the main building collapsed due to wind, and then later in the day at high tide, all the rest of the facility, and it all went up into the breakwater. So uh, everything we had went out to, you know, we call it out to sea, but it actually went into the breakwater. And of course, the, all the goods went to bottom and washed away. So uh, um, we moved three months later, we opened right here across the street from uh, it on the other side of the street. And today we're more of a hardware store. In fact, we don't even have a whole lot of marine materials anymore at the moment. We're just here to have all the basic stuff that people might need in a hurry or just basic stuff people need every day.
I build boats, and this boat that we have now, it's a, uh, it's a 37 foot catch, a wooden traditional built catch uh, that my friend Todd built for himself. He was gonna live on it. It's a cruising sailboat, you know, made to live on. His circumstances in life changed dramatically uh, when his partner like, pa passed away suddenly in a car wreck. And it took him a few years to let go of the boat dream. And I fell in love with the boat when I, the first day I saw it. I was like, if you ever, you know, uh, want help or whatever, I just love the boat right away. And um, a few years after that, he, after his, his wife, his girlfriend passed, uh, he offered us the boat for, a, I mean, we bought it. It's, it's, you know, we paid good money for it, but compared to the, commissioning of a boat to be built. It was a, it was a pittance, really. And um, he saw my wife Charlie and I as a likely couple to finish it off and get it in the water. Not everyone down east uh, dreams about stuff like that, but I think dreams that are out of the ordinary are pretty damn important. And um, squelching them out is a, a good way to make yourself like spiritually sick and really unhappy. So. We're chasing it. <laughs> I've lived here all my life. I like it here. Um, I visit places out of state and I couldn't wait to get back to this little town because we're so friendly. Went to New York once, walking up and down the street, not one person would talk to you. So we're very friendly here and very caring. If something happens, everybody finds money to help everybody. I don't know, everybody gets together and um, they talk and argue, but they always come up with an idea how to fix it. Sometimes there's no money, but they still find a way to fix things around here. Brahmin shit is a place where you salt the fish before you um, put it in the smokehouse. Okay, my husband is this one here, David. He worked there for quite a while, quite a few years. Seven years, I worked at the Brahmin shed, the smokehouse down there. This is the sluices up here. The fish are coming down into the bins, and these little plugs after the fish are taken out after they've been in there five days they pull the plugs and then they just drop the excess brine into the ocean january 10th 2018 so that's when it all started and everybody was wondering is it going to make it between the poles under the bridge That's what it looked like at low tide, just sitting there. And then I did pictures of it when high tide, and the water's even been higher than this before. And everybody was wondering which way it was going to go. Was it going to East Foot? Was it going to Grand Ann? Was it going to Campobello? Where was this building going to land, you know, before it was all over? So everybody kept chasing it around and watching it up and down the street and um, then it fetched up on this little boat ramp thing here for the night and then the next day the high tides it decided to move the other way and hit it down towards campabella bridge and then it ended up hidden down under the bridge and then ended up over to the island over to campabello well it all started I think with one word, scavengers. And then the war started, calling them scavengers, which they didn't really mean. We've been friends forever. They come over here, we go over there, but it was just a whole stupidness. Then 
everybody forgot about it. Everybody's friends again. Well, because everything down Front Street has been torn down. And I thought, I think this would be um, a good project to take some pictures and make a book so my kids and grandkids could have it someday. So this is one piece of history they got to see. The last I heard it was over there, you know, and um, some people took pieces because they've made fish out of it and uh, they've done all kinds of arts and crafts out of it. Nina Bowen is the one that helped me um, sell my books. I would have never sold a book. So word's been spreading around and a lot of people has bought my book, a book that I didn't think was ever going to go anywhere. And there were days where you didn't even want to get out of bed. But um, you decide what do you need to do that day. And there are always people to help you, we found out. First naval battle called Margareta Days. Sing along if you got the sheet. British captain was shot and died in the fight. County of Washington County. There was a lot of people down here that's really busted in the rear end to try to do something for the community. I'm also a veteran. I belong to veteran organizations. And we do our best to try to help our vets. And if you had people out there that's more than willing to step up, we could get a lot more stuff done. We try to help everybody, you know, everybody helps everybody. We all get together and if problems arise, we'll deal with it as a group and not individual. It's a good thing. I get, when I get a sick and tired, we get sick and tired. And I, you know, figured it out. Alcohol was my problem. Then I added drug to it. And it was a roller coaster. You know? I lost my leg due to gout. The green had already started to spread up my leg. And they told me they were going to amputate it at my knee level. And when I woke up out of surgery, um, it was uh, above, way above my thigh area. And uh, I, I thought I would go through a, a deep depression during that time because of having to lose my leg. It didn't. Uh, it made me more, uh, com more confident in myself and having to deal with my problem a lot better. To me, it was like an epiphany having to wake up again. Uh, I stopped doing drugs because of it. I stopped doing drinking because of it because uh, my health was more important in the long run. Just hiking, really. I'm not much of a cl mountain climber. I've, I've done Cadillac three times. Then I was 14. Went there with Audubon Society. And right now, me and my son, we've been planning to uh, climb Mount Katahdin next July, second week of July. We want to climb Mount Katahdin. He's doing his second tour in Afghanistan, and when he comes back home, he wants to commemorate one of his friends that died over there. He's from Maine, and he wants to commemorate his, uh, 
his death for him, and we, I decided I would climb the Mount Katana. It would be my fifth time doing it, so I added it to my bucket list this year. As far as next year, I'm going to register at the right proper time to uh, get in to Baxter State Park so I can climb the mountain one more time. I figure if I leave at 6 in the morning, I should be there by, uh, I should reach the summit by 12 to 1 o'clock, and I should be able to start my descent by 7 o'clock. I should be back at base camp at the base of the mountain by 7. So me and my boy, we plan on leaving like 4 o'clock in the morning. He's a military cop uh, in Afghanistan right now, but doing the second tour. He, he's okay, but I worry about him, but that's all I can say. Yeah, he's one of my twin boys. He's a twin. He's an identical twin, but... So there were lots and lots of kind people. One time, a lady that I just knew barely, my husband and I were there one time, she came over and gave me an envelope and said, I don't know what else to do, and it was an envelope with $100 in it. I mean, the tr truth is, I'm a really, I'm a really rich, I feel like a really rich, wealthy, fortunate person. I have a lot of skills and a lot of love in my life, and I've been to cities all over the country, and I've been down to Central America, and, you know, we have it pretty good here. Those are the kind of riches that I, that, that I find and I want to bring my daughter up in, and I brought my son up in, and you know, stay as tied to the earth as you can. And we all have to have jobs and money and all that. And but the more you can do that, you know, if you can grow a carrot and you know cut lumber and firewood and you know sew and build things, like it's all it all goes toward making a whole person. Well, if I'm trying to attach something, I usually just put a nail in. If I'm trying to like, get something really thin or an edge, it, it, I usually do glue. I've got two bottles over here. So. And sometimes I just make stuff like this. It's got like a, a kind of a sound. It's sort of like a harp. And it, I make a lot of things. It's, it's I don't really, Face too many problems, actually. My word.